Starting the recording, then I'll explain the questions to you. Okay, so your CP questions, very bad performance because all of this stuff has already been discussed. One minute. So she. I need to disconnect. And uh, okay, but this will also get. Uh, I had. Uh, so your first question was. Okay, so your first question was uh, the distinction between active and passive asset management. All of you have, most of you have got confused. I think pretty much everyone had got confused between traditional versus alternative asset management. Okay, most of you thought this was supposed to be the difference between traditional and alternative asset management. But the question is actually asking you about active versus passive asset management. Okay, so when we discuss this topic, uh, when we discuss this topic, let's look at this. The point, the last point. The last point in the distinction between TAM and AM, the last point actually says that the distinction between active and passive is a relevant distinction within TAM but is not relevant within AM because all AM managers are active managers. So there's no point in having a distinction between active and passive. It doesn't make any sense. Everybody in AM is an active manager. So the mistake most of everyone made was that you confused the distinction between active and passive management, which is a distinction which is relevant in the TAM universe, uh, you confused it with a distinction between TAM and AM. Okay, again, that's why I keep saying new concepts that you're encountering, you have to revise these concepts, be attentive in the class, and revise the basic concepts in finance you guys are not clear about. Okay, so this is the first mistake that you made. Okay, don't confuse this distinction so with, for, the, yes, audio being yeah, 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 the audio, the recording is running. Okay, so make sure that this, this, this you understood what mistake you made, right? So, uh, you are now confusing this, this distinction with this distinction. Okay, so what is the distinction in active and passive management? Essentially, some of you got this right. The distinction is, first of all, you should say that it is only relevant within the TAB universe. Okay, you can add value to your answer by saying, first of all, clarifying that this distinction is only relevant within the TAM universe. And in the AM universe, everybody is an active manager, so the distinction doesn't really is not really relevant. So it is in active versus all that's very simple stuff. You can just read up your notes once again, so I won't spend too much time. Active simply means that the portfolio manager will, uh, and remember in AM, uh, in TAM, remember one more thing that in TAM, the uh, benchmark for performance evaluation is typically just an index. Okay, so a BSE Sensex or the S&P 500 or the Russell 2000. Okay, so it's going to be some kind of stock market index. So it is relative performance evaluation. Okay, so the benefit benchmark for performance uh, because the risk management focus is relative. We can even make this one as this is a relative performance ev uh, evaluation relative to an index. Okay. All right. So uh, so all TAM is uh, evaluated. Uh, all TAM managers are evaluated uh, compared to an index. So when you come to the distinction between active and passive, the only distinction is that the active manager, even though he's evaluated relative to an index, is not going to slavishly mimic the index composition. You understand the index composition? The index has a certain composition, like maybe 5% uh, GE, 20%. Uh, you know, whatever, 10, 20 percent JP Morgan. Okay, uh, these are uh, uh, you know very high numbers I'm giving you, but these are so this the composition is this the, the, the composition of the index. The active manager need not and will not typically mimic the composition of the index. He will actively select stocks that may 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 or may not be in the index. And he will vary their weightage in his portfolio. Okay, so in this context, remember, uh, please look at the. Uh, I'll, I'll put in another note here. There is another note on Warren Buffett. Uh, there is another discussion between uh, Buffett and Charlie Munger at a Berkshire annual meeting where Buffett is talking about the number of stocks in the portfolio, the optimal number of stocks in the portfolio. Okay, so I'll just give this uh, here. How many stocks should you own? So Buffett is again trashing one more uh, holy cow in finance theory, which is diversification. Okay, so I'm giving you this link here once again. Yeah, how many stocks should you own? So essentially in this video, you'll see that Buffett is essentially saying that we go for highly concentrated portfolios. I don't believe in diversification. Okay, I want to own good companies and I want to own them in big chunks. Okay, so he's trashing diversification because normally in finance theory, diversification is recommended. Okay, different so different sectors. Yes, he's going different sectors. He will look at different sectors, but he wants good companies, solid companies.
companies with strong brands, good uh, reliable cash flows. But he is essentially saying that diversification is for idiots. What? Diversification is for idiots who don't have any skill in stock selection. Yes. He is saying if you are confident about your stock selection, forget about diversification. Own concentrated portfolios. You will see this in the video. Okay. So this is again. So what is the active? So Buffett is a classic example of an active manager. Because he says to help with the making the index, to help with diversification, I'm going to select some stocks which I think are very good and I'm going to own big chunks of them. Okay, so I have a very concentrated portfolio. Okay, most of the successful stock fund managers you will find go for highly concentrated portfolios, big chunks. Like Jim, Jim Rogers is another guy who is very successful in equity investing. He also doesn't believe in diversification. So, active managers essentially. Do not bother with mimicking the index. They choose whatever stock they want. They choose whatever composition, percentage, weightage they want. Okay, and deviate from the composition of the index. Whereas passive managers will slavishly mimic the index. Okay, so ETFs are examples of passive management. Okay, or you could have other passive funds, uh, which basically will slavishly mimic the index and make sure that they perform in the same way, same composition, same stocks. Okay, so that's the first mistake you made: active versus passive managers. Active versus passive asset management. Okay, second is asset management. What is tracking error? Some of you got the concept right, but the terminology that you used is inappropriate. Most of you, even though those who got it right, said kept on talking about stock versus some price of something. Very very uh, unclear language. The tracking error is the extent to which the your so first of all, then you should once again for the sake of context, one sec. One minute, yeah. Something else. First of all, once again for the sake of context, for your own clarity and for answering the question properly, you should clarify that tracking error once again is something that is largely relevant only in the TAM universe. Okay, because it's going to be relative to an index. Okay, so TAM is it's only relevant in the TAM TAM universe, the tracking error, and then it is only relevant in active management. Okay, in passive management, it is understood you will not have any tracking error because you are going to mimic the index. If you have passive, if you have a passive fund and you have tra tracking error, means you are really an idiot. I mean, you can't even follow instructions and you know uh, look at the composition and track that composition. So, tracking error is largely a this concept that appears within TAM and also within TAM within the subset of active passive management. Is everyone clear? Yes. Please make sure your concepts are clear. Concept uh, conceptual clarity is very poor even though these concepts have all been discussed uh, in the class okay so it is relevant only within active management and so tracking error is the extent to which an actively managed portfolio okay is underperforming relative to the index uh, which is going to be used to measure its performance okay the index which is the benchmark for performance evaluation so if i'm managing a indian equity fund and my benchmark is the bsc 200 Okay, and if my portfolio is down 17% and the BSE 200 is down 15%, then I have a tracking error of 2%. Okay, so you can clarify if you want. Sometimes people say even even if your uh, if the index is down say 15% and your fund is down 13%, some people say I have a tracking error of positive 2%. But I don't think this is a good use of the term. So we should only use tracking error to refer to negative returns that is underperformance or, or not and not over, uh, over performance but some people you should be aware would also use it on the other side symmetrically okay so here are what is tracking error yeah. only within tab within that only within the active asset management universe mm -hmm. and the extent to which actively managed portfolio is underperforming the index against which its performance will be benchmarked is this clear yeah. okay so no Notice the key ingredients of the answer. Okay, third question: What is a high watermark in asset management, and what is the connection to compensation? Uh, compensation. Some of you got this right, but once again, language used is very poor. Many of you, nobody, I think, except for Gaba, nobody used the word at NAB. Okay, everybody said is stock price, stock price, the highest point of the stock price. It's not the highest point of the stock price. It's the highest point of the return. When you are plotting the return of the fund, so essentially it is the highest point of the NAB series. Okay, so essentially if you look at this, anything, any any series like this, and this particular series, this was the highest point at one when you just started. Let's say this became the high water mark. If this actually instead of being a dollar Swiss chart, instead of this being a dollar Swiss chart. Okay, at least it's being recorded. So you should have told me this way. What happened? 
for hiding the questions. The other questions which I had intended for today, I was hiding them. Okay, so the recording is going on, so you'll see it in the video. But uh, yeah, so I, I, I thought I was <laughs> I was projecting. So anyway, um, okay, can you see this now? Yes. So instead of this being a dollar Swiss chart, okay, which it is a spot market dollar Swiss chart, uh, let's imagine that this is the performance of GABA's fund. Okay, this chart is plotting the NAV of a fund managed by GABA. Okay, so this again, once again, high water mark is something you should clarify is only relevant in the context of which kind of asset manager, TAM or AM? Saram. Saram. AM. Okay, so high water mark is only relevant in the context of AM. Okay, so when you can see here, when you look at the benchmarks for performance evaluation and the risk management is on, uh, and the compensation is as a percentage of asset managed plus the incentive fee. So because in TAM, there is no incentive fee. So the con the concept of the so when you hear when you are discussing a concept, you should also place it in the context. Okay, it is relevant in the context only of AM. Okay, because it relates to the calculation of the incentive fee. Okay, and there is no incentive fee in TAM. Okay, so here and then so how is the high water mark related to the incentive fee? Now let's imagine that this is the NAV. Now you remember what NAV is? Is unrealized profit included in NAV? Yes. Yes. Okay. Is unrealized profit included in NAV or not? No. 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 Okay, Vibhu? No. Rimani? Is my question clear? Is unrealized profit included in NAV? Nice. Everybody is sure there is no? That is wrong. <laughs> you have forgotten how NAV is calculated. You are doing your current project in interactive brokers. When you go and look at your NLV figure and the interactive broker account uh, figure. So you know how to get the account value, right? Yes, sir. There is an account tab on the top left. So if you click on that, you will see a value for net liquidation value. That is the same as the NAV. So check whether that includes the unrealized profit or not. Okay, so remember your OANDA uh, software interface also, yes, if you remember, yes Giri, yes, UI is very complex, <laughs> this you remember how to calculate a account NLV in the interactive brokers, in OANDA you have NAV, yes, we, we both realize and unrealize, okay, how is basic concepts, everybody has got it wrong in the class. NAV has to its net asset value, it includes the link, it is the, I mean, essentially the close out value of your fund. That's why they call it NLV in interactive brokers. Although the correct industry term is NAV. So it will include both realized and unrealized profit. Cash balance, so you look at your NAV, open your OANDA accounts, look at the account display, it will show you cash balance, it will show you uh, unrealized PNL, and then you will see that the uh, NAV figure that it is giving is the sum of those two. Okay. So how is it that you guys are not clear about this basic concept? NAV includes unrealized profit as well. Yes. So you were giving respect to high water. Yes. So you were giving respect to high water. So it should be. No, no. If you are clear about the concept, you are clear about the concept in every context. Yes. So in high water mark, there should not be unrealized profit. Should be. Why not? If the high water mark is a point on the NAV curve. Okay, this is the dollar Swiss chart. If it, if the high water mark is a particular type of point on the NAV chart, yes. on a time series plot of the NAV uh, of the NAV of a fund, yes, then why should it's NAV? NAV has the same meaning in every context. All the components. So I don't know why you are getting this confusion. Are you are you so clear now? Don't get the budget incentive fee on the unrealized profit. No, 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 no. It's not about the unrealized profit. First, be clear about this. If we are using an expression NAV, okay, once we have defined NAV as including both unrealized and realized profit. One minute. Be quiet. One minute. Let me answer the first part of the question. Let's be clear about the stepwise law. If we have defined NAV as including NAV is the sum of realized PNL and unrealized PNL. Is everyone clear about this? Should be clear about this by now. Okay, NAV is always the term, it's a standard term in asset management. So you should be clear, NAV is always the sum of uh, unrealized and realized profits. Okay, so it is essentially the idea is what will you get if you liquidate the fund right now? Okay, so at market prices, at current market prices. What happened here? Okay, I should. I do need a chart. Uh, 
Okay, fine, it's come back. So, strictly speaking, it should be uh, the uh, original starting balance okay. plus adjusted by realized right. plus so, unrealized. Uh, let's be clear. So, when we have defined NAV as including both the realized and the unrealized PL, then whenever we are using the word NAV in any other context, it will have the same meaning. This is clear. Okay, unless there are certain cases where we have clarified that in finance, because finance is not like physics. Sometimes contextual uh, usage uh, will will have a different meaning in a different. I mean, diff uh, the use will have a different meaning in a different context. Okay, why are we not getting this? Maybe there's a problem with the net. Um, let's just get any chart. Is it maybe there's a problem with the net? Okay, anyway, so let's be clear. The NAV is uh, sum of both realized and unrealized PLL, and the high water mark is a so understand it stepwise. A high water mark is a particular point on the NAV chart of a, of a fund. Okay, on the time series data plotting the NAV of a fund. Is this clear? Okay, it's a particular point. Now, what particular type of point? So that I need to show you some chart. Okay, let's hope this loads. We will try this. Okay, so let's just work, work with what we have. Okay. So let's say this is the NAV plot of uh, plot of the NAV of Gava's fund. He starts out, he makes up the, this much money, and then it starts to drop. Okay. So the idea behind the high water mark is it's the highest is the yeah. is the highest equity value. NAV is also referred to the uh, as equity curve. Okay. So the highest equity, the previous highest value for the NAV curve. Okay. And the connection between this uh, between the uh, on the NAV chart. And the connection between this and the compensation system is that when GABA has made this much profit, uh, the NAV has climbed to this level, and then the price starts to drop, the fund value starts to drop because he's making losses. Okay, we'll stick with the same. So let's take this as the NAV earlier. Okay, and it starts to drop. Okay, when it's making losses, when he starts making losses, so the, the fund NAV starts to drop, and it drops here, and then it starts to make a meaningful climb again. But the point is that the importance of the NAV is that this is the previous equity high. Okay, so when he has recovered from this point, 99.22, to say even this point, 100.43, he won't get any any credit, any incentive fee for the climb from here to here. He won't get any incentive fee because he needs to clear the previous high water mark. He wants to basically has to make a new high water mark. Okay, only then will he get the compensation. Okay, for the incremental high in the high water mark, incre incremental increase in the high water mark. Is this clear? So this is the idea. So you should revise it. Okay, maybe I shouldn't even have spent so much time covering this because you are already aware of these. Uh, uh, you are all, this is already there in your notes. But anyway, so let's quickly cover your, uh, uh, the, the make sure we have a coverage of the co concepts where Giri is saying there's a problem which, that he's facing. What is the problem, Giri, now? Let me just go through the decision problems in option trading. Okay. Your problem is related to decision problems? UI is complex. We can't do anything about that. The UI, we already showed you. One minute. Let's be clear. Let's... I don't know why this is taking so long to load. The net is slow, so let me try my own net. No, one minute. Okay, so decision problems and option trading will come to the decision problem. Let's just look at this. So all the decision problems are clear. You have to look at all the uh, individual tickers. You have to form a view on the underlying. That much should be clear from the video I gave you, yes. right? So here, let's look at why we get more. Let me just show you. I don't want to load the interactive brokers. Uh, uh, I don't want to load that interface now. It will take a long time. 
let me just show you where the so your decision problems are very clear you have to go ticker by ticker first form of view on the underline then form of view on the eyeball okay and as far as the eyeball charts are concerned what are you going to do here let me give you an example from some of the uh, because some of the charts uh, you have the uh, index you have longer data longer longer term uh, uh, time series data but in some of the charts in most of the individual equities you will not have that okay so let me just show you okay so if you have uh, in let's say we take the example of uh, Microsoft I'll show you how to enter the data so if you want now Microsoft st stock chart you will get the underlying chart brought from Yahoo Finance okay now as far as the eyeball for Microsoft and, the, and every other equity individual equity ticker the same thing applies okay for the uh, ETF tickers you have three or four ETF tickers okay you will find that I, for three of them I've given you the index uh, charts one is VXN those are those are uh, I've given you the tickers okay in the in the spreadsheet okay so now if I want to see uh, eyeball chart for Microsoft okay I will get at least one year of free data here the problem with eyeball is actually so I just enter the ticker in that box is this clear I just enter the ticker in that box and we get the data for Microsoft so this is the numerical data okay now you can see all the call option here we can look at this also this is also a straddle view but let mainly let me just show you the eyeball chart I then I click on this chart okay I just click on this volatility chart here then I get this detail okay so now you can see which one is the eyeball chart the orange or the blue the orange is the eyeball chart this is clear so I can at least get one year of data this is the problem that you know if you want good eyeball charts you need to have paid for a subscription uh, you need to be paying for some kind of website or uh, a Bloomberg terminal or something but we are trying to get it for free okay we can get it for many of the ETFs for free but uh, we can't get it for the individual stocks more than one year but you have only one year of eyeball data okay so if my underlying view on Microsoft I formed a view I'm bullish on the, on the stock okay so therefore I will be if I have to buy I will be buying calls okay if I have to sell I'll be selling puts okay is that clear okay so now the question is now but I don't know whether I should be buying options or I should be selling options is this clear okay how do I form that how do I take that decision I look at the eyeballs okay if I view on the eyeball chart is bearish then I will be selling a seller of options and if my view on the eyeball chart is bullish then I'll be a buyer of options okay so that will help me to solve my problem uh, by locating myself in that uh, if you remember that you have this uh, calc sheet where you have uh, the matrix the decision matrix okay <clears throat> okay so I look at this eyeball chart this uh, orange eyeball chart and I can take a view on what, what I want to be let's say if I'm a mean reversion type of player typically at this point I will be bullish because it seems to have reached the low, low end of the range okay but what you can also do is remember the VXN the carrot VXN ticker okay this is Microsoft options so if you go to Microsoft is the tech stock okay so if you go to carrot VXN VXN is actually the uh, uh, Nasdaq 100 index it's the uh, why is it not showing up a yeah so this is actually the eyeballs uh, this is the eyeball chart for Nasdaq 100 okay so you can look at the eyeball trend for so you get longer term data the only advantage of VXN is okay this actually corresponds to your QQQ uh, which is tracking the Nasdaq 100 index so for QQQ you can use this the advantage of this kind of chart is you can get a lot more data than just for one year okay you can get a lot of data you can look at even max and see how the so you can look at how tech bonds have behaved the eyeball for tech stocks has behaved for over the longer term but this is not exactly for Microsoft and then you can look at this and you can look at uh, where will be in the eyeball chart here so you can look at the Microsoft eyeball one year data in the context of some longer data for the for VXL okay are you following what I'm doing here okay I'm just trying to get some longer term data but VXN is the eyeball index for options on QQQ and QQQ tracks the NASDAQ 100 index which is the index of tech stocks okay are you following what I'm doing yes I just want Akhil is not clear you're clear not clear because Microsoft is a tech stock and I want some longer term perspective on eyeball trends okay that's all the only reason otherwise if you're happy with one year data 
I am not generally happy with only one year data. But you form a view on the eyeball, then you can decide whether you want to buy or sell. Here, if I'm bullish because I'm a main reversion guy, okay, so then I decide to buy, and my view on the underlying is bullish, so therefore I'll be a buyer of calls. This is clear. This is your matrix. Glass is over when the bell rings. I have an alarm. Okay, so you locate yourself here. Now, what is the problem? Next two problems is which which strike to buy? Which strike to buy? You have Microsoft options. Okay, which strike to buy is one decision problem. Here, I told you that you mouse over here. Let's say uh, you agree. Your UI complexity problem. Your UI in the option trader. The option trader user interface. In option trader, you have this channel kind of view. You can set it up. Calls on one side. Puts on one side. Just wait for two minutes. Just wait for two minutes. Okay. One minute. Just wait for two minutes. You can set it up here. Okay. You will set it up here. Now, is this clear now, Billy? Are you following? You mouse over. You will see bid and offer prices on each side. You mouse over the bids and offers. You will see some percentage values being highlighted. Can you see that? Yes. Those percentage values are the eyeballs. And what is the significance of eyeballs? The eyeball is the index of the option price. So when you want to decide which option is cheap and which option is expensive, you don't decide that by looking at the uh, option premium. Okay? You don't decide that by looking at the option premium. You decide by you decide that by looking at the eyeballs. So the options which have lower eyeballs are cheaper. Those which have higher eyeballs are more expensive. So when you are a buyer, obviously you will try to buy cheaper options. When you are a seller, you will be trying to sell more expensive options. But this has to be balanced with your view on the underlying, because the strike price is related to the view on the underlying. Okay? If you want to use some of the more complex strategies, which you see in the CME booklet that I gave you, okay, you can use. Think of that. But this is one easy way to solve the strike price decision problem. Okay? Which one to choose? Choose the ones if you are buying. Choose cheaper options. That means lower eyeball. Second is the decision that about the tenor, which expiry date to buy, so many expiry dates, which one to buy. If you are buying options, try to buy longer dated options. If you are selling options, try to sell shorter dated options. Less than 15 days, okay, 10 days, type 10 days, one week. This is clear? Yes, sir. All your decision problems are solved? Yes, sir. Okay, don't do early exercise. There's another decision problem whether to exercise early or not. Because remember, these are all American style options. Okay, as a general rule, we'll talk about this later, but general rule, no need to do early exercise. If you don't have the view anymore, just sell the option back in the market. Is this clear? Yes. If you're long the call, just sell the call. Don't do early exercise. Okay, solves your, all your problems. Giri, are you happier now? Go back and watch the videos once again. Watch this TWS option trader video that I gave you. Look for, this is a YouTube video on TWS option trader. Look for other views, uh, instructional videos from interactive brokers. Go to the website, look at the instructional videos. Okay? Alright, okay, you can go now. So the point to understand about uh, software is... TWS uh, trading software is going to be complex, you've got to deal with it. That is one of the skills you need to develop as a finance student. So what Giddy is saying, UI is too complex, too bad, deal with it.